Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Matrulo, and it's a pleasure to be speaking to you tonight. Um, so my term paper is about Pascal's wager, um, particularly how it can apply the, the same concept of, I guess, making a safe bet to other things in life. Um, in this case, whether or not people follow certain laws that are on the books uh, where they live. I, I've always taken an interest in the, the concept of a safe bet, uh, whether it was just simply stated, you know, oh, it's a safe bet to do this or that, um, just whenever you're working around the house with my parents or, or what have you. Um, but seeing kind of its origin where that uh, that phrase comes from and where it it really originally applied in the uh, the theological realm has been really interesting for me and I've I've enjoyed reading about it and I've enjoyed reading about Pascal and uh, sort of some of the other things that he did but uh, going back to Pascal's wager which we're gonna be talking about um, just a quick little overview on it. The, the, the wager basically says that it's good to believe in God because believing in God either means that there is a God and your belief in God has led you down a path through life that will lead you to heaven and that you've pleased God with your faith and all of that or that you've spent your life believing in God but God didn't exist, and it doesn't matter that you believed in him or not, because there is no God, there is no afterlife, you just die. Now, aside from the obvious issues with this uh, argument, you know, what if there are uh, other gods or a different god who don't um, support the, you know, classical Christian god, and all of a sudden you're a blasphemous sinner for... Uh, praying to this God, uh, aside from all of that, we look at how one can can take Pascal's argument and say, oh yeah, that, that's pretty pretty solid, I'm going to go with that, and I'm going to lead a life as, you know, the church tells me and as the Bible tells me, and, you know, maybe not to the T, but in general, and lead a good life, and all of a sudden we have some pretty decent citizens running around by most metrics. However, uh, when you start to break away from a uh, theological context and move into, say, a more uh, law context, people can take this idea of a safe bet and then turn it into, oh, I'm going to do something that isn't quite the right thing to do and isn't the... Uh, the moral high ground because it's a safe bet that I won't get in trouble. The uh, the first example I want to look at involves speeding. Pretty uh pretty low key stuff, you know. Nobody uh is spending twenty five to life in ma uh, supermax over a little speeding ticket. However, in most parts of the United States, speeding is illegal. Simply put, you know, there's a speed limit on every road and you're not allowed to exceed it. Police often give people a little leeway with this. Uh, most officers that I've spoken to, I've spoken to a number um, of local police officers and state troopers from the state of Connecticut, and they've said that generally around 10 to 12 miles per hour over the speed limit is when they start pulling people over. Now, this obviously has become kind of common knowledge because most people in a 25 don't drive 25 miles per hour. They'll drive 30 or 35 miles per hour. And even right past officers of the law who are clearly out to catch people who are speeding, they'll go at this speed because they consider it a safe bet that the police officer will not pull them over. This... Uh, this reasoning is similar to that which Pascal uses to justify believing in God and believing in the Bible and all of that. However, it's used in a way that would be considered 
bad. It's used to justify breaking the law. The same can be said for uh, people who choose to drive when distracted, be it texting, eating, you know, doing hair or makeup. Um, these people feel that it's unlikely for them to be in an accident despite the fact that they're not giving their full attention to driving. This, uh, this safe bet that they feel, they feel that it's a safe bet to, oh yeah, I can probably text and not, you know, be caught and not get into an accident or anything. This uh, familiarity and comfort in this zone of distracted driving has led to an increase in distracted driving, which has led to an increase in road fatalities uh, across the United States over the past three or four years. Interestingly enough, the same can be applied for much more severe um, laws, laws with more severe consequences. For example, in the state of Connecticut, uh, firearms laws are very strict. You can only own certain types of firearms. You cannot purchase new types of certain or new uh, firearms of a certain type, things like that. The list goes on and on. It's several pages long. You don't want to bother reading it. However, um, after the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, the state legislature passed a law basically saying you cannot own assault rifles um, beyond this certain date. You're not allowed to purchase new ones. However, if you currently own one, you're allowed to register it. You can fill out forms with the state police stating that you own it. They know you own it. They know that you lock it up. And you have to pay a tax to go with this. However, written into the law, it says that police departments will not be going door to door looking for these firearms and ensuring that people are in compliance, ensuring that people have uh, registered their firearms. So a number of people uh, have decided simply to not register them. They either see it as too much of a hassle or just believe that because the police won't actively come looking for them, that they have no need to pay the state to exercise the right that they had been exercising the previous day without having to have paid a $100 tax as they see it. These individuals are, are betting that the police will not find out that they have this firearm and will not find out that this particular firearm is not registered in accordance with the law. This again is, a, is an example of people using the, the safe bet method or Pascal's wager uh, line of thought to justify doing something that is unlawful by nature. Conversely, in the town of Kennesaw, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta, the, a town ordinance makes it mandatory for individuals who own a home to own firearms as well. It's literally a town mandate. Now, that mandate in particular is not enforced by the police, and that has been made clear to the residents of the town, so should they choose not to own firearms, they will not be penalized. However, Kennesaw, Georgia has seen an astronomical decrease in home break-ins over the past four years since the law was introduced. The state average in uh, home break-ins had actually decreased about 8 to 12 percent depending on the region of the state that you were in. Kennesaw, in particular, decreased a staggering 88 percent in home break-ins because criminals saw that this law had been passed and figured it was a safe bet that this individual, this law-abiding homeowner, is simply following the law and owns a firearm, and there's a much greater chance of them getting shot. In all, it's clear that people today use the this safe bet justification to choose what laws they do and do not follow, and even when to, they choose to break the law or not break the law. 
Thank you for your time. Have a nice night.